You're in the Business Insurance Zone with me, Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician. This week on The Biz, the mid-year life insurance review for 2013. And on today's show, oh, participating whole life insurance with special guest Bobby Samuelson, executive editor of Life Product Review. When it comes to life insurance, annuities, long-term care, disability, or group pension plans, we're the news you can use. Well, welcome everyone to the Business Insurance Zone. I'm your host, Steve Savant, and we're broadcasting to a nationwide audience of financial advisors right here in Fountain Hills, Arizona, home of America's largest fountain. And with me today, day four, pontificating on all that is life insurance, <laughs> Mr. Millennial himself, Bobby Samuelson. Hey, Bobby. Glad to be here. I have to tell you something. Um, this is going to be one of those episodes I can't hide from it. We always take major league hits and traffic. We're talking about participating whole life insurance as if it is profanity. I mean, you should see go out. The Google on I've this seen it, I know. is unreal. Bobby, why so much heat? Yes, it was interesting. Uh, did you read the Forbes article that I, said blame I, Bernanke? I can't believe you said that. Yes. Yeah, so I think a lot of people look at their whole life policies and go, well, this thing performed worse than I thought it was going to perform. And you say, well, Interest rates been falling for the last 30 years. That's a primary driver in dividend scales. Mm -hmm. You know, what did you expect? So I think whole life catches a lot of flack a lot of times unnecessarily. And mm -hmm. um, but look, I mean, there are some legitimate complaints. People have lost money in these things. You know, had negative experiences, and I don't want to belittle that at all. But I think the overall, let's put it this way: 50% of the whole life policies today that are still in the books are more than 25 years old. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that whole life gets on the books and it stays on the books for a mm -hmm. long period of time and people are generally happy with the contracts they bought um, that, and there are always exceptions mm -hmm. and there's all sorts of other stuff noise out there but you know whole life is a solid product well let's get my gripe off my chest right now let's do it i cannot we just went three days with bobby samuelson one of the most technical experts in the united states on life insurance and we cannot unpack and unbundle whole life we there's can, my gripe we cannot well, I, I want to know what is going on. It's it's this mystic bundled package product yeah. that I can't take apart. They're always taking apart UL. Well, I, full disclosure. Right, right. That's called full disclosure, not taking apart. And I can't do it on this product. That's right. I mean, and look, I, if you talk to some of the mutual companies that write this stuff, they can't pick each other's apart either. I mean, if you call Northwestern and ask them, and I've done this, call Northwestern and ask them what they think about mass. You know, Mass isn't going to tell them how exactly it all works or mm -hmm. what, what exactly they're doing. And they're, they're, it is a black box element. And that in one way can make people uncomfortable, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I think there's kind of a bigger issue here, which is, you know, what does whole life do? Well, whole life provides a guaranteed set of benefits. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed cash values, guaranteed death benefit, guaranteed premium. And then it gives you non-guaranteed additions to that in the form of dividends, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, but the gripe is, the dividends are a return of unused premium. It has nothing to do with earnings. So here's what's, so that's a technical term, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a great book on this uh, called The Story of Life Insurance by mm -hmm. Burton Hendrick, and you can get it on Amazon for two bucks. And he works through in the first chapter the best theory of life insurance you will ever hear in your entire life. So I really encourage you, if you want to know about mm -hmm. life insurance, buy this book, read the first couple of chapters. And give me a royalty because he just said that on my show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so um, no, I have nothing to do with it. But um, so, so what he says, and I think this is interesting, mm -hmm. is you know it is a return of premium, mm -hmm. right? But the reason why it's a return of premium is because there are already investment assumptions baked into the guaranteed premium. So yes, they're returning your excess premium to you, but it is a reflection of bond earnings because the bond earnings, whenever they exceed mm -hmm. the assumption in the premium, that's when you get your money refunded to you. Mm -hmm. So it ends up looking like a, like a yield. And I, but mm -hmm. I think the bigger issue is this. You know, look, it is refunding your premium to you. That's a technical kind of term, I think, more than a real term, the way you actually experience when you buy the product. Um, the real issue is you know, when you buy a whole life contract, you're not really buying a product. You're really not. You're buying the insurance company. Mm -hmm. And most of the companies that sell this position it that way, where you're buying a little slice of Match Mutual, or a little slice of Guardian, a little slice of Northwestern, a little slice of Met. And that's how that product is designed to work, is you know, look, you pay them a guaranteed rate that makes sure that they are profitable under basically worst case scenario, and then they, as mutual companies or MetLife stock company, credit back to you essentially mm -hmm. what is unused in, in the premium bucket. And so the net cost is less, and that's Well, that's let's go back, I just want, because I want to make sure our, our, our audience, and especially our consumer audience today, if I'm looking at par whole life versus, back in the day, it was kind of popular, whole life, but not, not participating. Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing all the things you just said, guaranteed, uh, premium, guaranteed death benefit, I got it all down. 
but I don't have the dividend issue. Why did that product die a death? Oh, it's, that's an incredibly hard, that's a commodity product. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it, if you're selling non-par whole life, I mean, there's mm -hmm. still, by the way, a lot of non-par whole life sold in the bank and, and mm -hmm. bank channel through single premium whole life and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, all that stuff is fixed, basically. And so, and so when, when that happens, I mean, that's a commodity product. You're competing on price. And at the end of the day, that's, that is unsustainable, whether it's guaranteed UL, whether it's you know, indexed UL, whether it's whole life. If you guarantee too much and you don't earn enough to cover that, you have a problem. Well, that is, that, mm -hmm. is, that, that is completely opposed to the way that mutual companies work, which is we want to first make sure we are financially stable and secondarily make sure that we flow everything through to our policyholders mm -hmm. over and above our overhead expenses, which is kind of the key did, piece. Did I just hear you make a distinction, though, on GUL, because if, it's, if the guarantees are long enough out and the commitment and the obligation is so great, there could be some kind of a disintermediation here. Yeah, yeah, totally. Same thing that happens on, I mean, look, uh, in, in, in Japan, they sold a ton of essentially non-par, or par whole life with really, really high guarantees on it. That's why all the Japanese life insurance companies went bankrupt in, t in the year 2000. They had to go back and fix all those things because they promised mm -hmm. too much competing with each other. Interest rates went down and they were underwater. So whole life really is sort of saying, look, how, uh, participating whole life, essentially says, look, how do we make sure the company stays solvent and we have a method for passing those returns back mm -hmm. through. And non-par whole life forces them to guarantee too much, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why it's a really challenging product to write. Now, I haven't seen too much of non-par whole life out in the brokerage where we live, yeah. but you're saying banking institutions are still uh, offering Absolutely, this. Absolutely, yes. Single premium whole life is like huge. Oh, that part, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And all yeah. that, Single stuff, premium, is, all that stuff is non-par, I mean, right. more or less. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that is still a huge component of the market on the bank channels because mm -hmm. it's simple, transactional, guaranteed issue, all that sort of stuff. Well, we've been doing spreadsheets, and there's some significant information, especially if you want to see the history on this. There's a great software that I always compete with. I, I mean, I buy it as a subscription called Full Disclosure, the historicity of everything that's going on in participating whole life. If you're interested on the real numbers, you can call me or go right out to their site. It's really great. We're going to continue talking about Par Whole Life with Executive Editor of the Light Product Review, Bobby Samuelson. And don't forget to visit our IULUniversity.com for the best training and education when it comes to life insurance for retirement income. You're listening to the insurance industry's number one resource for products, planning ideas, carrier information, and interviews you can use. When it comes to life insurance, annuities, long-term care, disability, or group pension plans, we're the news you can use. Did you know the average 401k runs out of money just seven to eight years into retirement? Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and many other publications have warned of the difficulty of saving with a 401k. But what if there was a way to create tax-free lifetime retirement income with no stock market risk? Good news, there is. You know, living in fear of the next market dive is not the way I want to live my life. Why would I go out there and take on risk when I don't need to? I have a lot less stress knowing I can't lose any more of my retirement savings in the stock market. Call now to receive your free, no-obligation analysis of what this retirement vehicle could do for you. A comparison to your current retirement plan and a free video that explains this exciting opportunity. Start planning a retirement you can enjoy instead of worrying about future tax increases and stock market losses. Creating income that will last your entire life is the most important thing you'll ever do. Take control of your future. Call now for your free analysis, comparison, and video. Well, welcome back to the Business Insurance Zone. I'm Steve Savant with Bobby Samuelson. And remember, you can order today's materials at thebiz.tv. And while you're out there, click on the Backroom Technician icon right on the Biz blog for their 30-day free trial offer for the best needs analysis and educational material that address almost every financial planning scenario. And just a heads up, before moving forward with anything you ever hear on my show, always consult your tax advisor and legal counsel, as well as your broker-dealer compliance officer if you are so Fender unlicensed. We're talking about the number one dirtiest subject in the life insurance <laughs> industry, participation in whole life, and I think it's getting a bad rap in a way. It is getting a bad now, rap. Now, remember now, Steve's, I don't sell a lot of it for, for death benefit. I sell a lot of it on the income for conservative people who are product suitable for it. Right. But that being said, I want to know about some fairness issues, and here we go. And this is going to draw some serious flack. It's okay, we're good with that. I've noticed that IUL, Index Universal Life, always shows back testing numbers and then they assign a number that we can use it's usually out there 8.3 to 9.1 right. index based on history now this is what they say based on history history 
whole life has never done went out and went to back to the 1990s or even a little farther back, maybe yeah. before the 1958, see, back in those right. days, the 58 CSO, never went back. And I noticed, I took tranches of treasury rates versus par whole life. And par whole life destroyed treasuries over the last 20 years. Yeah. But they never use that in their defense. And we're using back testing all the time over an IUL. Do you think that they don't understand that? I mean, the par whole life, they're purveyors of the product. Don't they understand the marketing issue? So I, I actually, I'm going to give them a little more credit. All right. um, I'm going to give them a little credit. I'm going to say first, the IUL back testing thing, you know, is a back testing, yeah. right? Because it assumes that the cap never changes. It, is, it makes a lot of assumptions, a ton of assumptions mm -hmm. in order to make that work. Um, you know, my favorite story is one company found that if they did their back testing on Tuesdays rather than Wednesdays, they could get 30 basis points higher look back rates. Was well, that any indication going forward of what will actually wait, happen? Wait, wait, for one 24 hour difference? Yes. On t if, they ran, if they ran on Tuesdays annually versus once a week, right, rolling mm -hmm. periods, Tuesdays versus Wednesdays. They got higher rates on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and so they would go on Tuesdays. Well, Bobby, I just want to know what that day is. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it makes no difference, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that's so that's so that's the issue with IUL is mm -hmm. okay, not not a good comparison to begin with. And all we've done past podcasts. There's right. all sorts of reasons for that. Second issue is okay. What about this ten-year Treasury dividend rate thing? Well, remember, mm -hmm. a dividend rate is obviously part refund of expenses, right? Part refund of mortality experience, part interest refund. So, so that whole number, let's say that number might be 5% or 6% or whatever that stated dividend rate is, mm -hmm. it's only one piece of the puzzle, right? That's, that being said, though, there are companies that are pretty clean in terms of their stated dividend rates pretty close to the returns they're actually crediting to their policies. Now, and if you go back and look at those numbers, you'll see that uh, for the period you mentioned, yeah, whole life dividends beat the pants off of 10-year treasuries, even beat the pants off a of AAA bond composite. Mm -hmm. The issue is, the re and I think the reason why the, why the whole life companies don't use this more often their agents may say it, but the whole life company won't put it on a sheet of paper, is because you know, the reason why that's happened is because for the last 30 years, interest rates have been falling. Mm -hmm. And anytime interest rates fall, and you're a portfolio crediting company, like all these whole life companies are, so you're averaging in your old assets with your new assets, and you're coming up with a new number, if interest rates are falling, that average number is always higher than the current market. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's old money, new money, always, and the average is always higher than new money rates. And so essentially the reason why carriers have been beating 10-year treasuries, one reason, a, a, a large reason, is because interest rates have been falling for the last 30 years. Now, do you think interest rates are going to go up or down in the next I 30 years? I do think. And remember, the 10-year treasury is already up 60 basis points. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, yeah. And it's going to continue to go up. Now, in a rising interest rate environment, you may see whole life products substantially lag 10-year treasuries. Well, now you're coming into my next question. Okay. Perfect, perfect transition. Okay. As we move up in rising interest rates, I kind of think whole life will have a little struggle on the climb versus current assumption you will. Now that's an interesting angle. I don't know if I agree with that. Well, well uh, the mechanics, I'm thinking the very reason you said, I thought it supported what I just said. Well, portfolio, see, UL is a portfolio crediting product, mm -hmm. as is IUL, as is whole life. They all have the same problem. What's going to be interesting is um, how true the carriers mm -hmm. stay to the portfolio crediting methodology. So one option is when interest rates go up, if you're a life insurance company, uh, you can either stay a portfolio company and have your products lag the market, but how attractive are your products going to be if they lag the market? It's going to be terrible. Not. So, right. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to transform into a new money company on the fly. So you're going to leave all your old portfolio stuff in a portfolio block, and then you're going to become a new money company and have new money rates. But, but there's carriers out there that are par whole life that have been doing this for years that have 10,000 dividend scales. I mean, they're, they're forever. They've been there for the 1950s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've been doing this segregation and separation of different that, portfolios. Well, so that's exactly why whole life companies kind of know what to do in a rising rate mm -hmm. environment. The UL contracts, I think, are really up in the air because if companies decide to become new money contracts mm -hmm. or new money, new money companies, you could see current policies sold today substantially lagging the market for a very long period of time because they're not getting the new money influx or the new new but, premium influx. But now it. let's just drop for indexing. Okay, that's current assumption UL for interest rate. But what about indexing? Because now I'm going to get a little bit bigger spread. Right now I'm what th going three percent for options. Well, is that going to be better or no? Not? See, see, it's the same thing. Right? It is the same. It is the okay. same thing. Yeah, because because and actually in index UL it can be a little it can be a little bit more than that because they're more they're more rate driven products, mm -hmm. right? The, the carrier's not taking as much of a spread. They're charging you higher policy charges. And so it's really totally built around that investment spread, and that investment spread shrinks or goes negative, you know, versus new money rates. Mm -hmm. Then you could actually have caps decreasing in a rising interest rate environment mm -hmm. because the price to hedge increases faster than the carrier's ability to afford. And I think that's actually a fairly. I think that's probably the most mm -hmm. likely outcome. And so when you look at current assumption, you know, whole life 
index to I mean, they all have exactly the same problem. It simply manifests in different ways. And I think whole life, um, it's going to be interesting to see what they all mm -hmm. do, but I think different companies will have different reactions, and I certainly wouldn't penalize one versus the other mm -hmm. one. Uh, I think they're all going to have the same issue when interest rates go up. Well, we may be at the beginning of rising interest rates, and we'll see who's going to win. Well, remember, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or email me, steve at thebiz.tv. That's the buzz on the biz for today. You've been in the zone, the business insurance zone. You're listening to the insurance industry's number one resource for products, planning ideas, carrier information, and interviews you can use. When it comes to life insurance, annuities, long-term care, disability, or group pension plans, we're the news you can use.